Oh, okay. You can wear a hoodie. You can like. I just we just happen here. You set me up. What are you doing? I know the tables have turned, right? Okay, cool. I'm gonna do an intro because that'll give people more time to sign on, and hopefully, then yeah. the Appalachian Trail Conservancy is gonna stream this live on their Facebook page. Um, but I want to welcome everyone to. Oh, great! It's working. I want to welcome everyone to week two of the Armchair Adventure Book Club. And this has been a really fun way for a lot of us who are at home and we wish we were on the trails to sort of revisit some journeys and talk to some people who have had really awesome adventures outdoors, which gives us inspiration and hope and a little bit of escape during this time when a lot of us wish we could spend more time outside. And today, especially, I'm excited. We're going to have a really good time because we're having one of my friends and a fellow hiker, AT hiker, fellow author, Derek Lugo, on to talk about his book, The Unlikely Through Hiker. And I was just talking to uh, Derek, who from this point on, um, we can call, I hope, Mr. Fabulous because that's his trail name. And it's one of my favorite trail names that I've ever come across hiking. Um, but his book is just, it's so funny. It's so lighthearted. It really reveals the best of humanity. And I think that's a theme and a concept that we can all get behind right now and that we all need to hear. So it brings me great pleasure today to introduce Mr. Fabulous. Um, Mr. Fabulous, can you tell us where you're calling in from today and what's going on in your neck of the woods? New York City. Um, hey, everybody. Um, first of all, I love your background. Thanks. And why didn't I get one? What's up with my background? I don't know. Do you recognize it? <laughs> yeah. Do you know um, where it is I, on the trail? Um, it's a knob. Um, I, I, where is that? It's the AT. There you go. It's the AT. <laughs> You can see um, there's the white blaze right there. Yeah. It's, it's Max Patch. Do you remember oh, that. that? Yes. Yes. I remember that very well. Um, so, yeah, I'm in New York City um, where it's the hot spot of this, this craziness that we're going through. Um, it's, you know, we're quarantined. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm getting a lot done. I get more sleep now. Like I'm relaxed. I'm watching like all my shows. No, nah. I like, I like the time I have, but the whole um, coronavirus thing, of course, it's, it's crazy. Um, things have changed here in New York city. My apartment, when I first moved here, I'm in like central Harlem. So a few, few blocks away from central park. And it's, it's a busy boulevard, really busy. Like when we saw the apartment, we were like, oh, it's beautiful. Didn't realize how loud it was until we moved in and we were like, oh my God, it is so loud. <laughs> and now I hear birds. It's, it's insane, it's quiet. It, it's, it, has, it hasn't been ever quiet. So that I dig. There's still people outside. Um, the thing about New Yorkers now, what we do is we clap because we care, like we, for the, the caretakers. Right. So every every day at seven o'clock, we're, we're clapping to like show our appreciation for, for the people that are out there in front lines doing, you know, uh, saving people. So it's, it's, it's changed a lot, but um, I'm making the best of it. I'm trying to, to stay productive. Um, I'm taking this time now to do more writing. I'm working on my blog, another writing project. Um, I know you just came out with an audio book for, for uh, Becoming Odessa, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm working on an audio book for, for the unlike, Unlikely Through Hiker now. So cool. I'm taking this time now to do things that I was going to do um, later on in the year. Because this year was going to be, it was going to be my breakout year. I was going to do my book <laughs> tour. I was like, this is it. I'm doing it. <laughs> and um, I was going to do some hiking, uh, you know, I was going to visit all these hiking towns and do some talks. So things have changed. So now my book tour is more of a virtual like book club like we were doing right now, which is yeah. great. As long as I get to talk about the AT and the outdoors, although I may not be out there at the moment, um, I'm okay. I mean, we're, we're great as like humans, we adapt, you know, like we don't just like just sit around like what are we going to do and wait like. I'm hoping everyone out there is adapting to the situation we're in. So that's what's going on in New York. 
don't yeah. know what else to tell you. You know, it's, uh, I was telling you earlier that I'm one of those guys, like I, I don't really watch the news, but since we live in New York City, I'm watching it now just to like stay like in, in the know, especially in New York City. Like yesterday, they, they told us that now we all have to wear a mask. Yeah. So, um, yeah. You know, just but you wanna... said trail bandanas work, right? The buff oh, bandanas, work. Yeah, I gotta get me an AT one. <laughs> like, so I can like, there you go. Totally that. Go to the AT store, check out bandanas right now. Exactly. Um, well, so this is like a great lead into sort of the first question I want to ask you, which is you are such a city boy, like you mm -hmm. are from the city, you're back in the city, but then one year, I mean, I think it was 2012, you decided that without any experience and, you know, not being really sure of what to do, you were just going to head out and go hike the entire Appalachian Trail. So what made you want to do that? And like, where did that idea come from? I, okay, so I'm a big, I love stories. I love reading, I'm a big reader. I love telling stories, hearing stories. I can sit down and listen to like an older, like do just talk about whatever for hours. Okay, and that was my thing. And someone, someone knew I was a reader and they handed me this book. It was hilarious. You know what I'm talking, the Bill Bryson book. Yeah. And they didn't tell me it was about the Appalachian Trail. They just said it was funny. And it was, it was hilarious. But the one thing I got out of it was this adventure that not many people accomplish. Mm -hmm. Like a lot, a lot of people may attempt it, but now I'm, I think, I don't know what the percentage is now, but when I first wrote the book, it was like 25% of the people that actually attempt the AT, finish it. Right. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I want to do that. Um, and it was one of those, like, just, like a pipe dream, like, yeah, you know, I want to like run a marathon or travel around the world. I want to hike the Appalachian Trail, but it, it wasn't something that I thought I would ever do. So um, I had just came back from, I was living in Italy for a while. I just came back from there and I had time to like not go straight back to work. Um, I didn't have to go back to Italy. And um, I've always, again, like it was the back burner, like, yeah, I'll do it, mate. But I was laying in bed and I remember it just hit me. I was like, I'm going to do the AT. I'm just, <laughs> just going to do it. And with no experience. I had never hiked. I didn't even know if I liked hiking. Like, <laughs> who does that? You know? So um, I decided I was going to go hiking. Within a week, I would say a week and a half, I was on a trail. Yeah. I, went to, I went to the outfitter. I was like, look, I'm going to through hike the Appalachian Trail. The guy was like, great great, let's get you gear. What kind of um, hiking gear do you like? What, what backpack? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. I, have no <laughs> idea. I don't know what's going on here. It's like, you've never hiked before. What, you don't, you, you never hiked and you're going to do a through hike. I'm like, yeah, well, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, people do that, right? I they swear, do. I went into, I was so, I was like, the things that like, I, what I thought the AT was going to be and what it ended up being was like totally different. The one thing that did help me because I knew I didn't have any experience. The one thing that did help me was that I went into it with an attitude where I'm going to accept whatever happens. I'm going to accept, and I know I'm going to hike in rain. Yeah. I'm going to hike in the cold. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, my people are from the tropics, man. I like the warm weather. And yeah. when I hit the Smokies, oh, God, yeah. man. Oh God. And it's beautiful. It was, but it was in the morning, my hands were like shaking and I was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Yeah. But I knew that was the one thing I knew I was going to hike in bad weather. Um, I didn't realize it was, I was going to hike in snow, but I did, but I accepted all of it. So that was yeah. the one thing that was going to drive me. And it was more of a challenge for me in the beginning where, and I didn't think I was going to write about it or anything. It was all I wanted to do was get from Georgia yeah. to me. That was it. Yeah, that's all. That's all I knew about it. I knew it was a trail that went there and there, but I knew nothing about the AT. So what was then um, as a total newbie? And I loved the part in your book, too, when you're like starting out and you're like, why do I have 24 packets of tuna and all these like ready to eat Indian meals? Like you're talking about, you know, the classic, like having too much gear, having too much food. But what was like your ultimate novice move? Like what's that one thing now looking back where you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like I, I can't like, believe I did that starting out. What was that? I like, remember I told you I'm a reader? Yeah. I had, I had like five books in my backpack. <laughs> You and Cheryl straight, man. I'm like, it, take one. Just take one. Get a new one when one. you finish. I started off with like a couple and then people, I just, 
people kept giving me books and I found a couple in shelters and I was like, oh, this looks good. This Christian books look good. I'm not even like, I'm like, why would I want this? Like, <laughs> like it's a book <laughs> and they're thin and then there's a bigger one. I'm like, oh, it's fine. I stick it at the bottom. And like, so I would say that the food, my pack was like 42 pounds when I first started at the coach trip. And it was, um, it was definitely the food, the ready to eat Indian food, which is water based, heavy. Right. Um, and also, I had a three liter bladder and like those, like kind of like Gatorade bottles. I had like those filled up. It's like, I'm gonna have enough water, enough food, and I don't know how long I'm gonna be in the woods. And like three days later, I was at like, like a store and I'm like, what the? I could have. I didn't eat all this. And then, you know, when you first start the AT, there's streams all over the place. Yeah. You don't yeah. eat it. And, and you're not even you're that eat. hungry when you start, you know? Oh, no, you're not. Like, it, <laughs> and when I, like, I fell straight as, like, when I, I did eight miles, I was so exhausted. Those steps are, like, they're rough. Yeah. They're rough. They're I passed serious. out. Like, as soon as I finished, I went to bed, I was, and I got up, and I was like, all right, let's do it again, you know? But you're right. You don't eat that much. No. And especially in the beginning, uh, when you start like getting your hiking legs and you're out there like burning calories yeah. that you can't replace, yeah. then yeah, you're going to be eating a whole pizza pie. You know? Yeah. Then so, you're like, where are my 24 tuna packets? Right? Like, yeah, well. exactly. That's when it's, <laughs> that's when you can do that. So I know, and you capture this like in the beginning of your book, but if you start out and you're trying to do the whole Appalachian Trail everyone's trying to give you a trail name, right? And you have one of the best trail names and best trail name stories that I've ever come across. Do you mind sharing that with everyone? Um, so in the beginning, people were trying to call me like the first two or three days I was getting like New Yorker, mm -hmm. um, Marley. I'm like, <laughs> come on guys, it's not Why? Let's no, no. Yeah, what, what, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> so, um, it was within like the second, the third day, uh, I started hiking with like a group of hikers. We didn't plan to be in a group, but it just happens. I started by myself and we just started hiking together. And within a week, that whole group was like 10 of us, give or take. Everyone had a name except for me and maybe one other hiker. So we all decided one night that we were going to just like, let's talk a little bit about your, talk a little bit about yourself and let us know, like that way we can figure out what, what to call you. I'm like, all right, cool. I, I like talking about myself. I can, I can do that. So I shared that when I first started, uh, my whole thing was that I was going to stay, like, I'm going to stay groomed. You know, my friends would make fun of me because I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, they would call me a metrosexual where um, I used to like, get my nails done, my hair did, you know, like wear a designer clothes, have my lotions, and now I do have my essential oils, all that. Yeah. And I would joke around that um, I wish I had like a, a full length mirror in my backpack so I can pull it out and like kind of like be looking up my dreads and stuff like that, you know, and that I was going to every stream or water source or whatever, I was gonna keep, I was gonna shave and stay clean. <laughs> And the one guy was, and I, again, and I also shared that I didn't have any experience, but I plan to do it. And this one guy was like, yo, you're, you're a Mr. Fabulous. And I'm like, what? Like, yeah, you're a Mr. Fabulous. And he went into saying, like, I think it's the Blues Brothers movie where there's like a, I think, I don't know if it's a trumpet player or sax, yeah. but his name was Mr. Fabulous. He was a yeah. suave guy, like, kind of like dressed kind of nice and all that. And I was like, dude, I can't. I can't walk around telling people my name is Mr. Fabulous. Just imagine that. Like, Hi there, I'm Mr. Fabulous. I know. And I'm like, what well, kind of like, I can't do that. He convinced me to hike with it for a few days. And I was like, all right, cool, I'll do it. And in the beginning, it was like, I was apologizing to people like, hi. They would, ask, they would ask me what my yeah. name was. And I'm like, um, you know, I didn't name myself, but they call me Mr. Fabulous, but you know, <laughs> kind of like that. And yeah. It took me a few days to start getting a little comfortable because then people were like, I would expect people to go, yeah, really, Mr. Fabulous? What kind of, what kind of eagle central thing? Yeah. What it's like a stripper name, right? Like, it's just yeah. weird. Like, if you don't knew the Blues Brothers, it's weird. Yeah, it's like, you know, like, why would I call myself Mr. Fabulous? It's like kind of like a, 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 like a sports nickname, like Dr. J or Magic Johnson, you know, like they don't really do magic and he's not really a doctor, but you know, but they do magic on the court and he's a doctor in the court. So it's like, 
okay, you know, people, so pe I was thinking people were going to be like, you know, why would you do that? But no, as soon as I said it, they would smile and yeah. laugh and they want to hear the story. How did I get that name? And I started feeling, you know, a little better about it. But the one thing, and I've heard this story a few times, yeah. Yeah. I was walking by myself on the trail and there was a group of elderly people. It was like maybe 10 of them. And they were doing a day hike and they were going southbound, I was going north. And I stepped aside so they can walk by and they were all like kind of congratulating me and wishing me luck. We were talking a little bit about my through height. And then the last person, she must have been like 100 years old, 150. <laughs> like she was older than the 18. And she had a cane and she had an aide helping her. And she came up to me and she was like, you know, what, what's your trail name? And again, still, I'm still trying to be humble. I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm Mr. Fabulous. And without missing a beat, she's like, oh my God, I've been waiting for a Mr. Fabulous my entire life and she she just went up to my face gave me a kiss and had like a little little pep in her step and she was just like she like left her aid behind and she was like <laughs> I was like I'm the cure for like like oldness like she's just like had all this energy and all so from that day on I, I decided hey, the the um, Mr. Fabulous wasn't just about me it was about sharing like the story my, my story and how it made other people feel um, so that's why I stuck with it um, yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. <laughs> I love that. She's been looking her whole life. I mean, that's what people do, right? They just wait for Mr. Fabulous and then there you are. There you were. And uh, it made me, I'm going to try to pull out some of my tech savvy now because thinking about your trail name and how much I love it, it made me think about some other unique or memorable trail names. And so I put together a little poll that I'm going to launch here and it's, there's a lot of good trail names out there out of these which are all folks that i've met on the trail which is your favorite so mr fabulous cheeto dust sleeps with skunk speedy turtle pretty jesus which is way more egocentric than mr fabulous <laughs> um yeah but that was funny this is a german guy and anything you said to him he always started every response with yeah but um <laughs> lightning rod is another Puff Puff, almost there. So uh, we'll let some folks answer the poll, see what their favorite trail name is. And while we're doing this, I'm sorry, I should have said this in the beginning, but if you have questions, um, feel free to contribute them as they come. You can write them um, in the chat. You can write them on Facebook. If you're watching on Facebook, those are gonna be sent over as well. We have conversations that are sort of steering the question, but or the conversation. If something's on topic, we can throw it in there. And then we'll also open it up for audience questions at the end. So um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead. Mr. Fabulous, you're, you're in the lead. So I'm oh, going to end nice. the poll. <laughs> oh, Mr. Fabulous, come on. I know. Uh, Sleeps with Skunks, second. Cheeto oh, Dust okay. was a good one. Yeah. yeah. We can share those results. Uh, keep that up for a minute. We'll keep that up for the next question which uh, you already kind of referenced, but I was so impressed with your attitude when I was mm -hmm. reading through your book, because you were just so zen about a lot of things on the trail, especially not having been a hiker. And mm -hmm. I actually pulled, mm -hmm. you mentioned this idea of acceptance, which I thought was so powerful in the state of the world that we're living in today. And there was something you said about the rain. And you said on, uh, page 46 of your book, you said, the most essential tool that I have is acceptance. Rain will be part of my through hike no matter what. I will have to trek through areas that may have significant snowfall early in spring and endure thunderstorms that can hit with little warning. The journey will go better if I don't dread and curse the things I cannot control. So I am just curious how that mentality sort of helped you on the AT and also how it's helping you now in this state of like COVID and coronavirus mm -hmm. and where this Zen acceptance comes from. Mm -hmm. um, I think, first of all, again, I had no experience. I had so much going against me. And the one thing, and I've, I've always been a people person, so that helped. And another thing, this whole hiking community, and we can talk about that later, um, was something that I didn't expect, yeah. which is one of the biggest thing that came out of it. 
but I think it was knowing that I needed to stay positive because if I didn't stay positive, I, w I wasn't going to make this. I wasn't going to. And my whole goal, again, wasn't to like the AT or love the AT, which I ended up doing both, um, but was to just finish it. Yeah. And the one thing I had to do is just accept it. Just accept whatever's coming and, and, and take in all the little things and go with it. And, and, then, and then throughout that, just starting with that drive and that mindset, everything else just worked itself. I ended up loving the AT. I started meeting the right people. Um, I felt like everyone I met on a trail, even if it was a day hiker, I, we would have a conversation. I was one of those guys that, I would start to trail late because I'm from New York City. I go to bed late, I wake up late. I was the last person I always to leave camp. And I would get I would get into the next camp late because not because I started late, because I was I would kind of like speed up a little bit just to catch up with people, but I would stop and talk to people um, that I would see like day hackers or whatever, spend like 15, 20 minutes talking to them. So that was one of those those things, and I don't know how I got to to, to me talking to other people, but oh acceptance and um how uh, well now with this whole um coronavirus thing i keep telling people and in the beginning and i still do it i would joke around about it and it wasn't that i didn't believe that this was a serious thing it definitely is but you hear it all over the place the news and all that it's it's sad yeah. i wanted to cheer people up i wanted to keep it positive because it keeps me positive and people need that i get messages from you know my followers on instagram that are saying thank you for that I needed that today. And I want I to just keep doing that and that, just stay positive. It's hard for everyone, I get it. Um, but we're, we're, gonna get, we're, gonna, we're gonna get on the other side of this. And do you wanna just stay miserable throughout the whole thing or do you wanna stay positive and know you're gonna reach that? And that was my thing was keep it positive. You know, you're gonna have some downtime. You're not always gonna be happy. But I would say the majority of the time I was on the trail, I was happy to be on the trail. Yeah. And again, I knew I was going to have some rough times and I just, just embraced it. Let it happen. Yeah. Well, I really admired that in, in your book. And I think your temperament is definitely well suited for the Appalachian Trail, which it's funny because like you call yourself in the title of the book is unlikely through hiker. And so much of what you did, I'm like, man, he did that a lot better than I did my first my first through hike or or even now i'm like that's a great life skill that i can learn um and adopt so i'm curious because you know at first i was like okay unlikely through hiker sure this guy with dreads you know mm -hmm. afro puerto rican it's it's your mm -hmm. your background and maybe color that make you unlikely and then i was reading mm -hmm. it and i was like what does make him unlikely is it the fact that he's from the city? Is it the fact that he's never grown up outdoors and backpacking? It's not cultural for him. Is it his ethnicity? Is it the fact that he just needs showers so much? Like, I was just wondering, like, why, why did you consider yourself unlikely to be okay. a hiker? hiker? I, at first, when I started, I didn't think I was unlikely. I didn't think that someone with no experience you know, would never do anything or wouldn't try. I mean, there's, there's people that actually, they've done what I've done where they got on a trail and they never hiked or whatever. But um, the one thing I didn't know that was an issue was that there wasn't a lot of Blacks or Latino on the trail. I didn't know that. I'm from New York City, the melting pot of the world. I have yeah. friends from all over the place. Never crossed my mind. I'm on a trail for, for days, for weeks didn't even notice, didn't even cross my mind until people like would come up to me and they're like, thank you, thank you for being here. Like this, this is amazing, like what you're doing. I'm like, thank you for being here. It's amazing <laughs> what you're doing. And they would break it down. They're like, and they were, they were just blunt about it. They weren't being malicious. They were just, a lot of people were excited that I was on the trail for, for just being the way I look. Yeah. Um, and they would tell me that, I was the only, so far, the only black person they've seen on a trail, which I thought was, I was like, there's no way, there's no way. So then I would look out and if I would see a black hiker, I'm like, see, I told you. And it would, they would do like, they were like section hiking or doing like a day hike or something like that. Yeah. And no through hikers. And sure enough, I didn't see anyone else that in, it didn't bother me. And people yeah. weren't, again, they weren't, 
they were they were they were actually embracing me. They were happy I was on the trail. They were like, yes. And one of the questions I would love to ask your audience, and well, that could be later, but people that threw hike, like, did you actually know that? Did you know that there wasn't a lot of black people on the trail? Do 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 white people know when they do this? Do they know there isn't a lot of Latinos or black people that do it? I don't know. It didn't cross my mind. It wasn't something I thought would be an issue. And I, I had like I was in the Smokies and I had this one guy, older guy in his 60s. And you know, the Smokies has a bunch of different trails. Yeah. And he said for a year, I think it was, I forgot the numbers in the book, um, The Unlikely Through Hiker. Um, <laughs> and he said he's been um, hiking for like 17 years, all these trails. And he said, he stopped and was like, you're like maybe five or six black through hiker I've ever, I've ever seen in like, you know, 17 years, whatever it was. Um, and he, did, he, he said that even before he said hello. It was just like, he just wanted to share that, you know? And then it was another time where I was hiking up a mountain. It was raining really hard. And uh, there was a hiker in front of me and he turned around and saw me. And he's like, hey, it's loud rain. Are you Mr. Fabulous? And I go, yeah, yeah, Mr. Fabulous. Like, oh, and he keeps going. I'm like, how did you know I was like, and I go, hey, how did you know I was Mr. Fabulous? He's like, because you're the only black person on the trail. And I was like, you know what? It's got to be the truth. <laughs> it's yeah. got to be the truth. So um, that was one of the main reasons, because that really stuck out for me. Um, I don't think anyone else had that experience as far as like, hey, we don't see a lot. I don't know. I'm sure there have, has been. Now, like, that season, maybe not so, but um, in other seasons. Uh, I think that and just... Um, being from New York City, not having any experience, um, being told that there isn't a lot of us out there, it was just a no-brainer. Like, yeah. it's, uh, you know, an unlikely through hiker. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that soon that won't, that won't be an issue. And, <clears throat> and I'm thinking it's been a while since 2012. Right. And I've been doing talks. I started my book tour actually with, with you guys in Asheville. But I went to a... Um, hiking event, uh, I think it was November, October, in um, Ben Oregon, it's a hiking area, PCT area. And there was maybe like 200 people there, and I was the only black person there. And the one thing, and I did a talk there, and the one message was like, this is great, I love it, I, I love that you guys are embracing me, but I do eventually would like to see more, more flavor in here, more, yeah. more people yeah. of color. Not because it needs to happen, it's because, and, and people ask me also, why do I think uh, a lot of, uh, why the black community, I can't speak for the entire black community, but why do they not do the trail? Um, and I can't answer for, the, I answer for the whole entire community, but I can say through my experience is that we just didn't know. There wasn't a book like this. Like if I wish little Derek had a book like this, the cover itself, this guy doesn't look like your, your typical hiker. You know, and in not just dreads in my color, but I also didn't dress like a hiker. I had band color bandanas all over the place. I looked like I was ready to juggle, like in, in Central Park, like <laughs> Times Square. You know, it was like ridiculous the way I looked. Uh, but I wish I had something like this. So, lack of of knowledge, um, also not being able to, you know, afford like normally um, tents and backpacks and all that. It's you know you hand it down from like you know father to son or daughter, you know, that you've been doing it since you were a kid. And also the whole lore of like the woods is dangerous. You know, you only go in the woods if, you know, you're a teenager, you want to get murdered by, you know, Jason or something like right. that. You know, it's like one of those things, you're scared, you're scared of it. Yeah. Uh, but um, yes, I, I don't know what, what, an what question that was, if I answered it, but yes. Yeah, yeah no, I think it was great. And, um, you know, I'm, really grateful that you had such a positive experience. I think in your book, you said the trail has open arms for diversity. Um, and just ask then like, you know, if, if we want more diversity, like how can we accomplish that or achieve that? And I remember when we had you down here for the book talk, there was this guy who came up to me afterwards and was like, this was amazing. It needs to happen now. Like tomorrow I need to go hiking and it has to be diverse. Oh, and I just got the chance. Yeah. But I was like, it's not going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> like, 
yeah, what, yeah, what yeah. Mr. Fabulous is doing, what these people are doing and storytelling is such an important component. But I know um, for me, one of my most gratifying experiences was hiking the AT the first time in 2005 and, and personally feeling like, oh my gosh, there are no solo female hikers or very few. And now 15 years later, you can go out and be like solo female, solo female, solo female. Like there's a ton of them. Uh, but I think it takes, it takes time. It takes cultural acceptance on and off the trail. It takes um, storytelling and examples. And so I think what you're doing is, is really important for the, tr the entire trail community, um, yeah. which I'm so grateful for. You get, and you um, yeah. So, okay, another thing I want to talk about, I'm going to check the time too. Okay, I want to talk about the writing process a little bit and also open it up for questions. But um, two, two more things from the book that really stand out to me. Again, like we mentioned, you were super zen and chill and accepting and just kind of took the trail as it came. And then you got up to Virginia, to the end of Virginia, and you were like, I'm going to do the four state challenge. Uh. Uh, and it seemed uh, brutal. And so I was just wondering if you could tell us, what is the four state challenge? Why did you want to do it? And do you regret it? Like in the book, uh, I was like, oh, I don't know that he's happy. He just did that. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, when people <laughs> ask me what's one of my biggest regrets, that's one of them. Doing yeah. that and also I hiked with a dog for a minute. And that's oh, yeah. another story, but losing, <laughs> losing that dog. Um, the quad state challenge is when you hike four states in 24 hours. So it's West Virginia, uh, Virginia, um, uh, Pennsylvania, and I'm missing, oh, uh, Maryland, Maryland and Pennsylvania. And then you start at the border of West Virginia, Virginia. And I decided to start it. And the thing, the thing with me was you're on the trail for five months, six months, and I wanted to change it up because all you're doing is you're getting up and you're hiking and then you go to bed and you're, I wanted to change it up a little bit. And I would do a lot of the challenges and a few I wish I didn't do. And this was one of them where I wanted to um, just go fast, just do it overnight. I, I had never hiked that night and I want, I was going to do it with my buddy overdrive yeah. and he bailed out and I ended up doing it by myself. And it was, it, it was the worst thing. Cause like I was supposed to, <laughs> I was supposed to go to bed at like four and then wake up at like 11, you know, pack my stuff and leave by 12. I couldn't sleep because I was eager to do it, like nervous because I was by myself. So then I had already been up for, what is that? Like 12, 18 hours or something like that. Yeah. And then I planned to like stay awake for like, I don't know, 18 more hours. That was, it was nuts. And at that time I had five books in my pack. Yeah, and I had just gotten like um, uh, food dropped at Harper's Ferry, so I had like brownies and cookies. And you know they heavy, but I'm a hungry hiker, and I was like, I am not leaving this. I am going to bring these with me. So my pack was even heavier than it was when I first started. So that's not a good way to to to, to start like a, a a challenge that is a time challenge. What you need to do it within 24 hours. So I started. I'm I'm hiking at night. I get lost. I cross like the street. And I, I just cross instead of, you know, that sometimes the trail goes down the road and back in. I just cross and I'm like, I'm like, I don't see the blaze. And I'm like going over like all these branches and all that. And I'm lost. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to pitch my tent here and I'm done. It was the worst thing. It's like hiking and it was pitch black. And I'm afraid someone's going to sneak up behind me. And of course, when you're that paranoid, you're hearing everything. You know, and then someone had just told me like the day before that if you, you're hiking at night and you see like these glowing eyes and if they're in front of their face, then that means they're carnivores. But if they're on the side, you're good. And that's all I saw was just eyes like glowing eyes in the front. I'm like, I'm going to die. You know, like it was, it was. So then I'm hiking. It's daytime. I'm hiking the whole day. And by the end of that day, I'm just like, OK, I'm going to end up hiking at night again. So I'm stumbling, I'm like half asleep, and I finally get, I'm, I go through Maryland, which I hear is a beautiful state, but I don't know, because I was half asleep, and I was just stumbling, it was dark, I couldn't see it. Right. Uh, to this day, I still want to hike that section again. But I get to the, the Mason-Dixon line, and I just drop, and I just, I cry. <laughs> 
I'm done. And I didn't make the 24 hours. I think it was like, I don't know, 24 and a half or so. I just missed it. But I cry and I'm like, why did I do this? Why, what what was the purpose of this? And I didn't, first of all, again, I, I wasn't prepared for it. And I just, I wouldn't do it again. It's just, if people think that's fun, it's not fun. It's don't, yeah. don't do it. Don't do it. I did it because I wanted to change and I thought it would be great, great adventure, great story to share. And yeah, that's one of, that's definitely one of my biggest. Did you know about that when you threw a hike? I've the never done challenge? it. I've never done heard? the four state challenge. No, don't do it. Don't do it. It's not worth it. I've heard, yeah, it's been around a long time, but I think you redeemed yourself when you then did the half gallon challenge. You were like, this oh, is my type of challenge, right? Yeah. Eating I ended a half eating, gallon of ice cream. Yeah, I could have done two gallons. It was, that was simple. Uh, so I'm going to take a, an audience question. And this one's a great one. Apart from maintaining a persistent positive attitude, what one piece of advice would you give to aspiring through hikers? Mm, I would say don't, don't do what I did. First of all, know that you like to hike. <laughs> do that. Do sections. Um, do we, I would say do a week of hiking, five, five days of hiking overnight and make sure that you, you can do this. Because don't start, because you're going to spend money on gear. You're going to spend money on travel, depending where you are in the country. You're going to spend money traveling, drops, a lot of preparation, a lot of time. Don't do all of that and then realize when you start that you're going to be miserable. Make sure that you're going to at least dig what you're doing. That's my biggest advice. Don't, don't do what I did. Um, I luckily fell in love with it within a week. And the hiking community embraced me, helped me out. Like, again, my first day at Springer Mountain, I didn't know. I had all this gear, didn't know how to use any of it. And hikers were just amazing. They didn't think I was going to make it. Yeah. But they were helped. They didn't make fun of me. They didn't laugh. They just helped me. They may have talked junk afterwards, like not in front of me. But I saw a hiker a month later at, I don't know what town it was, but he was like, dude, you're still on a trail. You know, like he was like shocked. So I would say be prepared with anything in life. Prepare yourself. That's, that's my key advice. But Because people, people think, oh, yeah, he did it without any experience. I can do it. No, don't, don't go that route. Please don't go that route. Okay, but I do sort of feel like if you had done a three-day overnight at Bear Mountain, like to try it all out before starting the AT, you may have been like, mm-mm. Like I could just see you like trying it out and not taking a shower. Like I think the commitment was a big deal reading your book. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Knowing that I had no choice. I had nowhere else to go. I, I, you know, I I was stuck on the trail. So yes, that, that being, but yeah, Bear Mountain, three days. I'm like, okay, it's, especially by myself. It's too spooky. I can't, I can't do it. Okay. Speaking of Bear, Bear Mountain, um, there you get to see wildlife in a zoo when you hike the Appalachian Trail, which is always fun. But you had some cool animal encounters during your journey too. I think my favorite was uh, reading about, and you always said that you were like trying to take pictures of it too. So um, at some point, I'd love to see some of these photos, but you said you saw a snake eating like a half-eaten squirrel, right? Mm -hmm. Like a snake and Mm -hmm. a squirrel. Mm -hmm. And then you had these weird bear encounters where they were like attracted to you for some reason and then you really wanted to see a moose too so my question for you Mr. Fabulous is what was your favorite animal encounter and then I have another poll that I'll throw out to our audience and that is which animal would you most want to see on the Appalachian Trail so let me figure that out and then you tell your story of your favorite animal encounter Um, now, again, being from the city, everything was spooking me out, like squirrels running on dry leaves, like chipmunks making the crazy noises. Like I, I, those encounters, especially in the beginning, I had to get used of the, the sounds of the, the wilderness. I would say um, my, my favorite, it's very simple, uh, was this fox. Cause fox, I, and I found out later, that fox, it's hard to see a fox because they're very like, they're scared of like humans and they're, 
they're never around. So I'm hiking and this fox, it was like a cartoon. He was just hopping along, like didn't notice me. And I see him and I'm like, oh, he's beautiful. Yeah. And he, he just, he sees me, he's like, and he jumps up, it was like a cartoon and he storms off. And I was like, whoa, I wasn't supposed to see that. Yeah. And as I bring my camera out, like he was gone. Yeah. But I would say just seeing that creature alone was beautiful for me. Um, again, all these little critters I was excited to see. Bears for some reason, Shanti says that I'm, it must be my, my animals, what was it called, animal? Magnetism. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know about that. Cause you, Normally bears, they're like big, big scary dogs where they hear humans and they, they run off, you know? And for me, that was the opposite. They just kept coming toward me. At one point, I went off the trail and I was lost, which happened a lot, but I, I was good at like backtracking because if I didn't see the white blaze, I would stop. And I'm like, okay, wh where am I? And then I backtracked and it was bear, like right, like maybe like a couple, like a couple yards away from me, but he was just eating grub, had his eyes closed, and I was like, already had a bad experience with this other bear that chased me. So I backed up, and people were like, dude, just make noise, man, make noise, make yourself like big, make noise, and you're fine. So I make noise, I'm like, cool, he's gone. I go back up, and he's closer. I'm like, what <laughs> the further, what is going on here? So then at this point, he just keeps, well, he's like curious, he's like, this crazy guy, let's see what's going on. He gets closer, and I'm like, okay, I gotta make myself big, I'm like, hey, hey, and he's just like, this fool, and he gets closer and closer, at this point, I'm like, I'm gonna run. That's it, and there's like a big tree, and I stumble over it, and I just, he just kept coming down at me, and then I decided, my, my craziness, because I don't consider myself a purist, but I'm like, I just missed the, like, maybe. I know, oh a section of it so i'm he's up on a ridge i go over the at goes this way i go over and i'm like i, f I find a blaze and I'm, I'm scot free i'm good to go but my this dummy was i was like you know what i'm gonna go back and get that section so i go back up to where i got up and he's like even closer and his bear is like this fool i should eat him no nah, he's just too like and i just <laughs> I, I think I didn't check my draws, but I think I, yeah. I may have beat myself. Yeah. And I just go down, and he's just looking down at me. And I just go, and I finally escape. But yeah, I made I made a situation, and even with my first bear encounter, I made a situation that didn't have to be that ridiculous. I made it, I made it worse. So I would say, and I didn't get to see a moose, which I wanted to. Yeah, I tried my hardest. I saw moose scat. I would hear a moose. You know, I heard moose mating. I heard everything moose. I even had a moose lollipop when I went into town. I had everything. I almost bought like a plush like moose. Nothing. Didn't see the actual moose. So that was, that. that's my biggest like thing that I want to, I have to hike New England again and see if I can, if I can see one. Well, you are not alone. Apparently from our poll, um, that's the most popular animal that people want to see is a moose. Someone but said I Bigfoot. did. I when you backtrack to like tag up on the trail that the bear forced you off of, I was like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> I cannot believe you did that. And then the other thing you did that just kind of like, oh, you know, was so funny to me is you got to Katahdin, you got to the end of the trail, and you were climbing the last mountain, and you had already like you were in a mile and a half from the last campground. I got this. You turned around to get your hiking poles. I was like, you did an extra three miles. Like you turned around on Katahdin to go get your hiking poles, so that when you got to the top, you could have, you know, everything that you started with also at the end mountain, which is nice. But I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't believe you did that. So here's my here's my question though. So you had your poles, you had some important things you picked up along the way, but what's something like that you feel like you had emotionally or mentally, what's one thing you had the last mountain that you did not have the first mountain? What's one thing big you like gained? It does not something physical, but like what's one thing that you had in that final photo that you found in yourself on the Appalachian Trail? Um, I would say, um learning about the hiking community. I talked about this earlier. That was the biggest thing I got out of my through hike because I didn't expect it. And I have now to this day, 
And the hiking community extends, it goes further than just hiking together. Like you and I, like you're a hiking family to me. You're like a good friend to me, but we never hiked together at right. all. But you um, did hike with friends of mine. I did. Yeah. I, we threw hike together, yes. Yeah. Um, but the hiking community, it's so grand. That was the biggest thing I got out of it. And being able to express myself in a way that I wasn't like, I'm open now to say, like, I love you to like friends. Like a lot of my friends, when, um, you know, when we hang out and then we part ways, I say, I love you. You know, just, I, and I used to never say that, you know, I still cared for my friends, but now I'm more open with my affections with, with people. Yeah. Uh, because of that that whole experience yeah yeah okay last two questions um for our book talk today but it's a book talk and author to author i just want to know like you said you set out on this adventure and you had a journal but you never planned to write about it so when did you decide to write a book and what was that process like and was it harder or easier than through hiking mm, i i decided I would say halfway through my hike that I was going to write about it mm. uh, because people were approaching me for many reasons. And, and they, I would share my stories. I like to talk. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but um, I can talk. And, sh and my love of the AT was so great. And I felt that I needed to share this experience. I couldn't, I couldn't hold it back. Yeah. So I decided halfway that I was going to share the story. And I did have a journal. But the first draft of uh, The Unlikely Through Hiker was off the top of my head because mm -hmm. I, I finished in September, started writing in October. Mm -hmm. And my whole thing was towards the end, I was thinking, I wish I had a cabin where I can just go and, and write for three months. Because, you know, that's where writers go to, to write as a, as a cabin yeah. or teenagers to get murdered by Jason again, you know. But... Um, I went in a cabin to write for a while, and I don't know if it was 18 Magic or what, but one of my hiking buddies, uh, Voice of Reason, he's in the book, his parents were like, hey, we have a cabin, you can stay there for three months if you want, rent free, just start your writing. It was in Pennsylvania, up on a huge hill, small town not too far away, and it was perfect. Because I didn't want to go back to New York, too many distractions, I knew I wanted to stay away a little bit longer, and um, so I started at the cabin where I decided I was going to write a certain amount of words a day. And it didn't have to make sense. Like I would had an idea what that chapter would be like, but I wasn't checking for spelling, grammar. I just put it down. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the story went from here, from, from one thing, and then I would just skip that story, but it was part of that chapter and just wrote, just wrote. It was like a puzzle that needed to be put together. So I would write, it, it started off as a thousand words a day and 1500 words a day. And so I got that goal, made that goal, I would keep writing because I had the time, you know, and that's all I wanted to do. And then by the time I went back to New York, I would have uh, a rhythm, a momentum of writing. I was just afraid that I would go back to New York and say, hey, I'm gonna write about the AT and not do it. And in writing about the AT, was it harder? I would say, yeah, it, it took me six months to hike the AT, but I lived the AT for two and a half, two and a half years, three years, yeah. because I was focused on the book and I relived it over and over again. Um, writing about it, I would say it was harder to hike the trail than write about it because I it just came out. It was a story that needed to be told. Um, I would say it took more time, yes. Yeah. Um, and I was a little more tedious about it. And they say, it was hard for me to like, just say it's done. Like there's a saying, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably say it wrong, but artists normally don't finish their art. They just walk away from it. They abandon it, you know? And then here's, here's what, I could have I kept working on it, but here it is. And you decide if you like it or not. Um, so that was my whole process was just making sure I got the words down. I knew you said, I heard you in a video. I don't know if it was yesterday or whatever, but you didn't, you didn't write your book thinking you were going to share it with people. This was, it was for you. Right. Becoming Odessa. Odessa yeah. Right. I, I knew I wanted to share this story because again, I wanted someone that saw little Derek saw this mm -hmm. and I, I didn't know if I was going to inspire them to hike but at least do something outside of their comfort zone 
and maybe achieve their, their dreams or try. And that was my whole mindset with this, that I knew. And, and, and another thing is if I didn't think I was going to, if it was just for me, there would have been a lot more curse words in this. There's not, one, <laughs> there's not one curse word in here. I made up some words, like son of a Brooklyn Bridge and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, on a peanut. I, that was a good one. <laughs> which one? Suck on a peanut. Yeah, yeah. Because I wanted kids to either have, have their parents read it to them or read yeah. this. Yeah. And I can't with curses. So yeah. my intention was to share my story. And this is the first, I have a bunch of other stories that I've written before this, yeah. but this was the first one that I felt comfortable to share and knew I was going to get it published. People were asking me like, how are you going to get it published? I don't know. I just want yeah. the story down. And that, that stuff I worry about when it's time, how to market it. I'll worry about that when I get to it. Yeah. So someone did, one of the audience members asked about missing chapters and I would love a, um, an adult rated chapter at some point. Okay. Maybe. I, I, I have one. I have one for you. Yes. That Good. will happen. That can be, yeah, that can be an add on extra maybe. And, uh, if you haven't read the book yet, it is so good. The Unlikely Through Hiker. It just, it makes you feel warm. It's what, it's a book about the AT that I read having done the trail several times and it's just feels new and fresh and it makes me want to do it again. I love it. Uh, we have the book signed by Mr. Fabulous uh, available yeah. at our online shop, which is blueridgehikingco.com. So you can get them author signed there. And there's many other places to pick up his book. So I hope that you'll do that. And uh, one of the final questions today I have for you, Mr. Fabulous, is um, you are so fabulous and you have brought oh. so much um, positive attention to the trail and to pursuing dreams and stepping outside your comfort zone. So first, I want to say that everything you've done and the person that you are, that's enough right? Like, I don't want to just enter this mentality of like, what's next? It's not enough. You're not enough. Prove yourself again. Mm -hmm. But I know you always have things going on. So I'm just curious, like, what are the next projects for you? And if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I also did a poll so that people can vote on your next projects. Because I know what I want you to do, but you can tell okay. us what you want to do, what you're working on. And then okay. you can take some advice from our poll as well. Great, great. Um, I want to continue writing. I am, I, I want to continue doing not, maybe not at a, at a, such a grand scale as the AT, but I will eventually do another through hike. Uh, I want to continue writing right now. What I'm working on are my, my blogs. I have chapters on my website, DerekLugo.com that there's chapters that didn't make it to this, this book. The book was, uh, supposed to be 400. Well, it started off 400 pages oh. and they cut, it was cut down to, yeah, it's a lot. It was cut down to 200. Yeah. So, um, there's chapters there. There's a couple chapters that I wish I kept in here, but, um, it's on my website. I'm working on another, another book. It's a children's book version of the unlikely through hiker. Which oh. I'm have, yeah. I'm hoping to have done by the end of the year, maybe sooner. because I'll have the time and, uh, also working on an audio book of the unlikely through hiker. Uh, but yes, I do plan to do other hikes, other adventures, uh, other books may not necessarily be about hiking, maybe yeah. about outdoors or traveling, but I, this is just the beginning of, uh, of, of what I want to do as far as my writing. That's so what awesome. is what, what, or do you have a, uh, total so far or? Uh, yeah. So I really want you to do an, um, AT up comedy routine. I don't think I can vote, but that's, that's what I want you to do. Um, I, I, I could put something together. <laughs> I think that would be so funny. There's, and you're, you know, you have the personality and I think the skills, the stand up skills where you could pull it off. I loved uh, on your journey when you ended up hanging out in New York City with almost like 10 through hikers from the trail that year. And I, you know, I thought it would be a neat concept. There's a brewery in Charlotte, which is two hours from the trail, but it's called Blue Blaze Brewing, and they're very AT-centric and have a lot of 
trail talks and speakers and do trail magic. And uh, it'd be really cool to see something like in New York that's very AT centric. So um, that would be really cool. I, my first uh, in 2013, like a year after my through hike, someone did a play off Broadway play, AT play. Yeah. And I think ATC had um, sponsored it. Cool. And I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Was like, wow. And that's actually a really good idea. Right? Like, let, okay, I might have to, I might have add to that, put something together. Add that to your list. Um, yes. Okay, cool. Well, I hope um, this does not have to be the end of Mr. Fabulous for anyone. I hope you follow him online. His handle is Derek Lugo, his name. His book is awesome. Again, you can get it signed at blueridgehikingco.com. Um, and if you're live streaming with us on Facebook at the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, I just hope you remember that the trail is really there for everyone except right now, no one. <laughs> um, and there was this really powerful email sent out this week from the Conservancy talking about advocacy. And one of the best ways to advocate right now is to stay home and stay safe regardless of whether you are in New York City or down in Asheville, North Carolina, where I am. And um, yes, let's continue to live our adventures through our Armchair Adventure Book Club. Next week, we have a book that really just like touched my, touched my heart. It's one of my, um, favorite books of all time. It's called Untamed. And this one is not an Appalachian Trail specific book. It's about a self-taught female naturalist uh, from Georgia. She's spent most of her life in Cumberland Island, Georgia, and is considered an authority on sea turtles. And she has just the most captivating story that's been written so beautifully by the author, Will Harlan. Um, so I'm really excited about that. All the authors here are just so talented. We're really lucky to have them and they're just such real genuine people. So Mr. Fabulous, thank you for being so fabulous and hopefully we will see you all again next week. Bye y'all. Thank you. Thanks.